All right, so we've got a, I've got my sermon is on uh, Psalm 15, uh, so if you want to turn there. But it also goes hand in hand with uh, Brother Jason's sermon from this morning on the rules of engagement, because um, this also speaks about how we should speak and act, especially to our brethren. Um, but this is in regards to um, having fellowship with God. Um, so in Psalm 15, verse 1, it says, A Psalm of David, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So do you want to have fellowship with the Lord? You know, to be in the presence of the Lord, and who doesn't want that, you know? But this is about who the Lord considers when he's looking for fellowship. Um, so to be part of the nation of Israel, um, you had to keep the Lord's statutes and commandments. To be saved, you had to, to go to heaven. You only had to just, uh, to be circumcised of the heart, to believe on the Lord, to have no other gods before him. Um, but to have fellowship with him, and to be part of the nation of Israel, that peculiar people, it was through the statutes and commandments of God, which for them included circumcision of the flesh and keeping the Sabbath days. Um, but it's no different for us today. You know, we don't need to be circumcised in the flesh. Um, we don't need to keep the Sabbath days or keep the meats, the washings, the meats and drinks, um, the ordinances of the priests. Um, if you read uh, Colossians 2 and Hebrews 9, it makes it clear that we're no longer under the uh, Levitical priesthood, so those things have been done away. But we do need to believe on the Lord and be circumcised of the heart to be saved. And if we want to fellowship with him and be part of his peculiar people, then we need to keep his statutes and commandments. So the Bible says in Hebrews 12, a lot of you are familiar with this, the chastening is for our profit. It says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So we endure chastening when we break the commandments, but it's for our profit that we may partake of his holiness. You know, so that's why God's saying, who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? If you want to partake of God's holiness and to dwell with him and abide with him, then, you know, it's taking chastisement when we do wrong, but it's keeping the commandments and trying to keep his statutes. So uh, we'll get you to turn to Psalm 89. We'll start reading in verse 30. It says, If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to, fall, to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. So if you break the commandments, it can't cause you to lose your salvation, because you can never lose that. But he will chastise you with the rod and with stripes. And he'll never break his covenant or condemn you to hell. Psalm 94.12 says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. So keeping his commandments... It's for our profit. You know, in Deuteronomy it says observing and keeping the commandments is our righteousness. And it's, uh, it's for our good. Um, the righteousness of Christ is imputed unto us when we believe. And that's how we can stand as the new man before him, perfect and holy. But while we're on this earth, you know, we need to walk after the Spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it says we're not saved by our righteousness but by his righteousness. Titus 3 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. How, how do you do that? You do that by reading his word. You do that by keeping his commandments and statutes. That's how you wash yourself and be clean you know, on this earth. And that's what we need to do to be able to have fellowship with the Lord. But the righteousness, our righteousness is our works. But they're filthy, they're filthy rags in the context of salvation. Um, but if you're a son, they're pleasing unto the Lord. And you will be rewarded for keeping him. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if you don't have faith, your righteousness is as, are as filthy rags. But if you do have faith, your righteousness is good to the Lord. So back in Psalm 15, verse 2. So then it goes on to say who this person is. It says, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. So a righteous man, a man who, walks right, who works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. 
So it's not unlike the previous sermon I did on works meet for repentance. Um, this is what God's looking for, someone who walks uprightly and who works out his righteousness. Um, and if you do good works and you love your brother, you will have fellowship with the Lord. So read through the book of James if you want to know what kind of good works you should do. That's actually a very good book because the book of James is about doing good works, not about doing works to be saved, but doing good works to your brethren to work out your, the righteousness of your works. So we'll turn to, uh, back to Psalm 15, verse 3. Um, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbour, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbour. So these are the things we're getting into where Brother Jason preached this morning. In verse 2 it was speaketh the truth in his heart, so about speaking truth, but also not speaking lies and backbiting, um, not doing evil to his neighbour, not taking up a reproach against his neighbour. So that's the opposite of a righteous man. You know, a backbiter is someone who is not loving to their neighbour, someone who speaks ill of others to, uh, about them but not to them. So speaking behind their back and gossiping about them. So if you have an issue with your brother, you take it to him, don't backbite. You know, and all of these things are about hurting your neighbour. So doing evil, that can be harming them physically, bringing a reproach against him. That's when you speak against someone to besmirch their name or ruin their reputation. They, they're trying to discredit you. Um, so that's what doing evil, uh, sorry, that's what bringing a reproach is, is when, you know, you're speaking evil of someone in order to ruin their reputation. And they, these are all things that will cause you to lose fellowship with the Lord. You know, the Lord doesn't want to be with this kind of man. He wants to be with a righteous man who will he'll work his righteousness and speak the truth in his heart. And he'll speak love to his brethren. He will not do these things to him. Now, it'll also cause you to be chastened to the Lord, which is something we, we all really don't want if we can avoid it. Um, so back in Psalm 15, verse 4, it says, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoureth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So we're just on the first part there. You know, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. So we're to hate the evil and to love the good. You know, we hate those who do wickedness and are vile reprobates. Psalm 139, again, a very familiar psalm to all of us. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am that I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So again, we see the importance of being a man of your word, you know, a man who speaks the truth. Um, so we shouldn't, you'd also, we shouldn't swear an oath. Um, but if you do, even if it will cause you harm, you still must keep it. So that's what it says here in verse, in verse 4. It says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So again, that's about swearing or making a vow. And I'll be going into that um, right now. So in uh, so yeah, that's what a righteous man will do. It will get you to turn to Ecclesiastes 5. Brother Jason was there this morning, so he was reading from, I think, verses 1 to 3. Um, but we'll read verses 4 and 5. This is what God has to say about it. It says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So breaking an oath is wicked, but it's better not to make an oath at all. You know, because if you do break it, that is wickedness before the Lord. Um, now I was going to skip over Numbers chapter 30, but I think we'll read that. So I'll get you to turn to Numbers chapter 30. Because this is a very good chapter about making vows. So we'll start reading in verse 1, Numbers 30, verse 1. It says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So again, there's no excuse for breaking a vow with God. He says, You must do it even to your own hurt. 
So that's why it's just foolish to make vows, to be quick with your speech, to not think about the vows that you're making, um, but to actually, you know, consider your vows. If you're going to make a vow, you need to really consider that because you must come through on that vow. Otherwise, God, you know, is very displeased. So in, uh, in verse 3, So if a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord, and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace. Sorry. And her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. So again, if your father hears, talking to the young women here, the unmarried women, if your father hears a vow you make, and he says, no, I don't agree with that, you cannot make that vow, then he has the authority to disannul that vow between you and the Lord. Uh, but we see further, you know, in verse 5, if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows, or of the bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul, shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her, because her father disallowed it. So any vow you make, your father has that right to, to say, yes, you can make this vow, or no, I, d I don't agree with this vow. Because you're under the, the authority of your father before you're under the authority of your husband. So, because it goes on to husbands here as well in verse, uh, in verse 6. And if she had it all in husband when she vowed, or uttered aught out of her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disannul her on the day that he heard it, then shall he make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. So again, you know, you've, you've got a choice here. You know, it's better not to make a vow at all. But again, if you, if you make a vow and your husband says, no, I'm not going to allow you to make that vow with the Lord, then the Lord will forgive you for that. Um, but it's still to be very careful about making vows and swearing to the Lord. So we'll turn to Matthew chapter 5 now. We'll read from Matthew 5 chapter, uh, verse 33. So this is what Jesus has to say about vows. He says again, You have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is, it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is, it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more of these cometh evil. So it's better just to be a man of, the, of your word, a man who just speaks the truth. You know, if, if you say you're going to do something, then do it. Just be a man who say yay, yay, or nay, nay. Don't be afraid to say no, I can't do that. Don't be afraid to say no, because at least then you're speaking the truth. You know, it's better to just, you know, just keep your communication yay, yay, or nay, nay, because it says that anything more than that comes of evil. So, and there's also a story of, uh, of the man in Judges 11. I'll get you to turn there. But he has to sacrifice his own daughter for a vow that he made. So in Judges 11, we'll just read a few verses here, 31. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Like this is a foolish vow this man's making. He has no idea what's going to happen, what's going to walk out his front door. So, you know, this is just an absolutely foolish vow to make. We see in verse 30, 34, and Jephthah, Jephthah, oh, sorry, Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. So again, this is the man who understood. He made a vow, as stupid as it was. He made a vow, but he can't go back on that. You know, because breaking a vow is worse than making a vow. You know, I mean, you should just not make a vow at all. But when you break a vow, you know, you've promised to the Lord and you're refusing to pay. 
you know. So in verse 39 it says, And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which she had vowed. That's a burnt sacrifice. And she knew no man, and it was custom in Israel. So again, he, this man paid a, a very steep price for his foolish vow. It was better that he had not made a vow at all, but he kept it to his own hurt, which is, again, what we see in this, in this scripture here, that you know, even if you sweareth, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So even if it's going to hurt you to keep this vow, you still better keep that vow. And the same goes for marriage, same goes for any vow you make, that you must keep that vow between you and God you know, you must not break it. So in Deuteronomy 23, verse 21, it says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And we also see in Joshua 9, you know, Israel made an oath to the inhabitants of Gibeon that they would not slay them, you know, as the Lord had commanded, because they were tricked. You know, they came and they made it look like they were from a far off land, but they actually were, were a neighboring country. Um, but, you know, the Lord had commanded that they destroy them all, but they made a, a vow with these men. They made an oath with them that they wouldn't kill them. So they had to make a league with them and they had to honour that. So they end up enslaving them and using them as slaves instead. But even then, you know, they had to keep that vow even though it was bad for the nation to do so. You know, so keep your vows even to your own hurt. So Psalm 15 verse 5, the last verse, He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. So again, it's about not taking advantage of others through predatory lending, false balances or scales, and not taking gifts which are bribes to subvert justice and judgment. So Exodus 23.7 says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked, and thou shalt take no gift, for the, blind, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. So again, people who, who take gifts, take bribes, you know, it's to pervert judgment. You're not going to get good judgment out of a person who's accepted a gift to give a certain ruling. Deuteronomy 16 says the same thing. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Proverbs 17, 23, a wicked man taketh the gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. So it's a wicked man that does that. That's not what God's looking for when he wants fellowship. When you want to abide with him, he's not looking for a wicked man. He's looking for a just man, a righteous man, someone who works out their righteousness, someone who speaks the words of truth out of their heart, someone who doesn't backbite, someone who keeps their vows, you know, someone who's a man of their word. And it's about being honest and truthful in your dealings with, with other people, especially your brethren. Uh, Deuteronomy 25 says that in verse 14, Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small, but thou shalt have a perfect and a just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So again, is what they do an abomination? He's saying, look, the people who do these things, that's an abomination to the Lord. These people are an abomination. These wicked people who don't have a just weight, who will, you know, a false balance is where, you know, you'd, you'd basically, sometimes they use, like they'll shave off uh, the weights. So when they put the weights on, you're getting less than you're paying for. You know, that's, that was a common thing. And he's saying, look, don't have a just weight. Be a man of your word. Be a man of integrity. You know, speak the truth in love. You know, don't lie about people. Don't backbite. You know, this is what God's looking for. And all these commands, they're for our benefit. You know, if we want to have fellowship with the Lord and to live a long life. It says, He that doeth these things shall never be moved. 
So if your foundation's on the Lord and on his perfect law and commandments, that you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, mind and strength, and you love your neighbour as yourself, which he says all the commandments hang on these two things. It says you'll be firm and grounded, you will not be shaken or moved. So he's instructing us on how we can have fellowship with him and to have a long life. And how do we do that? By having our foundation firmly on the rock of our salvation, on the cornerstone, the foundation stone, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's pray.